Yasaurananda Gaja Janarhanjana Jamuna Tira Havana Shahadiya Jamuna Tira Havana Shahadiya Jamuna Tira Havana Shahadiya Havana
Nithai Gaur Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Nithai Gaur Hari Bhav Hey Jaya Jaya Prabhupada 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 Jaya Jaya Prabhupada Hare Krishna. So I was today requested to speak on uh, Shikshastakam prayers, <coughs> the prayers written by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his final years before he departed the world. And this was when he was in the Gambira, in the later part of his Lila. So this is a very broad topic, it's a very mysterious topic, it's a very intricate, complex topic. But what I'll try to do is give a quick overview of the essence of these eight verses. <clears throat> and we can recite, maybe together, the first verse. Cheto Dharpanam Marjanam Bhava Mahadirvagni Nirvapanam Shreya Kaiva Vichandrika Vitaranam Vidya Vadu Jivanam Anandam Bhudivardanam Pratipadam Purnam Rita Swadhanam Sarvatma Snaparam Param Vijayate Si Krishna Sankirtana Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nija Sarva Shaktis Tatar Pitani Amitas Maranena Kalaha Etat Rishri Tabakripa Bhagavan Mamapi Dordai Vamidri Sami Hajini Na Nuragaha Trinada Pisoni Chena Tayori Vasu Hishnuna Amani Nam Amanadena Kirtaniya Sadarahi Nadanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavita Vajagadisha Kamoye Mama Janmani Janmani Ishware Vavitad Bhakti Rahai to Kitwai Ayi Nanda to Nukam Patitam Mam Vishame Bhavam Buddha Kripaya Tabapada Pankaja Tita Duli Sadrisham Vichintayam Nayanam Gladadas Rudadaya Baddhanam Gadgara Guraya Gira Pulakhair Nichitam Papukada Tavanamama Hare Bhavishyuti Yuga Itam Dime Shena Chakshusa Pravisha Itam Shunya Itam Jagat Sarva Govinda Virahena Me Aslishya Vapya Ratam Pinastu Mama Darshanam Mamahetam Kurotuva Yatatata Vavida Tulampata Mad Pranam Astu Eva Napadaha Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually wrote two things when he was in his um, Leela as Nimai Pandit in his early part of his life, he wrote a very uh, complete and expert explanation on grammar and Nayak logic. And he wrote a book. And he was about to make that book available. But it just so happened that one other person also wrote a book on the same topic. 
And when he heard that Nimai Pandit had written a book, the same as his, he became quite unhappy. <laughs> and so he went to him and said, you know, I've written this book and you've written the same and no one will read my book. <laughs> So Nimai Pandit, Lord Chaitanya, he took his book and threw it in the Ganga so the other person would feel happy. <laughs> so that's the only other thing he ever wrote besides these eight prayers, which are, as described by the Acharyas, the complete science, and we use the word complete with emphasis, the complete science of Bhakti Yoga. Srila Prabhupada says the Goswamis of Vrindavan, they wrote all of their books based on the teachings of Shikshastika prayers. These are very deep, very intricate, very complete explanations of the process of Bhakti Yoga. We know that the Vedas consist of three major topics. <coughs> completely, Sambandha, relationships, Abhideya, the process of devotional service, and Prayojana, which is the goal of devotional service, which is love of God. All of the Vedic knowledge is contained within these three categories. And uh, these eight prayers comprise in a very succinct and very concise way the whole, these three principles, Sambandha, what is relationships, what is our relationship with Krishna, what is our relationships with other living entities on different levels of existence, what is our relationship with the spiritual master, what is our relationship with the material energy. Uh, relationships on all level of existence is the largest, the most, what we say, fully explained topic than the Vesas. And then we have, second is Abhideya. Abhideya is the process of pure devotional service, which means hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord and following the instructions of the bona fide spiritual master. And by doing that, the third topic, which is the smallest of all the topics within the Vedas, is the goal of the Vedas, as Krishna says, Vedanta Krit Vedavit Eva Chaham. I am the compiler of the Vedas, I am the knower of the Vedas, and the Vedas are meant to know me. The purpose of the Vedas is to know Krishna, and by knowing Krishna, developing love of Krishna by serving Krishna. And that's Payojana, which is the last and not as voluminous as the other two topics, but still the essence. So in the explanations by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who mainly out of all of the Acharyas spoke mostly and wrote also Bhakti Vinod Thakur specifically on these eight prayers. There's one particular book that circulates, circulates along, around ISKCON, it's called Shikshastakam. And if you get that book, you can hear the commentaries and the explanations by these two Acharyas. The eight prayers consist of the nine stages of bhakti. And I'll explain that. Uh, Adaustrada, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivritti, Nishta, Ruchi, Ashakti, Bhava, and Prema. Srila Rupa Goswami has compiled two verses explaining the knowledge that he received from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu directly that the essence of the development of bhakti goes through nine particular stages. Adao Strada means one has faith some faith, and there, due to that faith, it brings them into the association of devotees. In the association of devotees, one starts to practice the process. Hearing, chanting, glorifying, serving the Supreme Lord. As that develops, one desires to become 
fixed and serious in devotional service. So one seeks out and eventually takes shelter of the bona fide spiritual master. That is called bhajana kriya. And from that, the spiritual master guides the disciple in the process of bhakti, which helps to eliminate what is called the anarthas. The word artha means something auspicious or wanted. Anartha means something inauspicious, undesirable. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains there are four categories of anarthas, 16 anarthas altogether, four categories of four. And on that stage, then, one struggles on this stage to make progress in devotional service. As one is guided by the spiritual master and seriously executes the process, they rid themselves of the anarthas. And I'll just mention the four categories. Philosophical misconceptions. Uh, an artist caused by pious activities, an artist caused by impious activities, and an artist caused by aparads or offenses. And there are four categories of four. When 75 percent of one's anarthas are more free, then they come to the platform of nishta. Nishta means they're fixed. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> They're solid in their execution of devotional service. And by executing devotional service in that way, they come to the next stage, which is ruchi. Ruchi means a sweet taste. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that verse? Prasannatma na soshiti na kangshiti samasarveshu bhuteshu madbhakti labhate param. That the devotee develops transcendental happiness and doesn't lament any loss of anything material, doesn't hanker for anything material, and they're fixed in devotional service, they're happy. And that happiness is continuous. It's not something that comes and goes in the early stages of bhakti, but it's a continuous feeling of pleasure within the heart of the devotee. In that stage, as that matures, one comes to ashakti, which is the next stage, which is the seventh stage. Akshakti means one gets attached to Krishna in a very strong way. One cannot stop thinking of Krishna. And there are many characteristics of this stage that one doesn't waste even one moment of time without serving the Lord. That's the stage of ashakti and really strong attachment for Krishna. Um, well, as that matures, one comes to the stage of bhava. Bhava is uh, preliminary love of God. In other words, affection for Krishna. Develop deep, heartfelt love for Krishna in its preliminary stage of development. It's not developed completely. It's like a mango that's almost ripe. <laughs> but yet still, it stays on the tree for a little longer. In that stage, one cannot stop thinking of Krishna. One exhibits ecstatic emotions when they think of Krishna, when they serve the Lord. These are higher stages of bhakti. And Baba goes through different stages. It has six levels of expression. When it reaches the sixth level, it moves into the next and final category, which is called prema bhakti. On Prema, there are eight stages, and then one starts to develop full love for Krishna. And in those stages, one can not, not even, it's not possible not to think of Krishna. If someone would tell that person, don't think of Krishna, they would think it's impossible. <laughs> On that stage, there are many ecstatic symptoms described by Srila Bhaktivedanta Thakur and Jaiva Dharma. Many of that is also explained by Srila Rupa Goswami and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindar Nectar Devotion. So these are the eight stages. Now these eight verses correlate with these, with, these are the nine stages. These eight verses correlate with these, eight, these nine uh, stages. And I'll explain each verse in relationship to each of the stages. Uh, 
This is a very intricate understanding because there are so many different interpretations that are not contrary, but at the same time parallel to the explanation of these eight verses. Many Bhakti Siddhanta and Bhakti Vinod Thakur are the most authorized, but there are others have also commented on these verses. In the first verse, I'll recite the verse. Cheto Darpana Marjanam. It cleanses the heart, cleanses the mind. Baba Maha Dirvagni Nirvapanam. It pushes back the fire or the suffering of material existence. Shreya Kaiva Vichendrika Vitaranam. This is a beautiful part of this particular first verse. Uh, Shreya means auspicious. Kairava, Kairava is a lotus flower, but it's a special kind of lotus. It only grows in the evening time. It's almost lotus flowers are nourished by the sun, but this Kairava, this particular lotus flower is nourished by the rays of the moon. <laughs> so the cooling rays of the moon upon the lotus, the kairava uh, opens the lotus flower. So the moon-like cooling of the chanting of the holy name awakens one's good fortune or one's love for Krishna. So that's the third verse. The third, third benediction. The fourth one is vidya vadu jivanam. Now vidya means knowledge, vadu means bride. <laughs> So, and jivanam means life, or gives happiness, gives joy. So, just as a husband gives joy to the bride on the wedding, <laughs> similarly, in the same way, the holy name gives life to transcendental knowledge. So, when you chant the holy name and at the same time expose yourself to the knowledge that's in the scriptures. You can understand these knowledge scriptures. You can't do it simply by dry speculation. So it's vidyavadhu jima anandam budi vardhanam. Ananda means bliss, or not only bliss, but unlimited bliss. Budi means ocean or deep. And vardhanam, no, vardhanam means unlimited, and bodhi means ocean. There's an unlimited ocean of transcendental knowledge that comes with chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And there's a little, little antidote, a little, not a little, that kind of illustrates this particular point. And that is that um, Krishna looks at Radharani, they're together, and he sees how beautiful she is, and he becomes happy. And then she looks at him and sees that he's become happy, and therefore she becomes more beautiful, and then she becomes more happy. And then when she, Krishna looks at her, he sees that her, she's become more beautiful, he becomes more happy, and he becomes more beautiful. And then she looks at him and sees that he's become more beautiful, more happy, she becomes more beautiful, and then she becomes more happy. Don't try it with your wife. It might just go a little bit, but it's not unlimited. <laughs> you might work once or twice. So in this particular little exchange, what does it mean that, that, and this is very important to understand that the jiva is part and parcel of Krishna, but the, but the happiness that the jiva can experience is unlimited. There's no limit to how happy you can become. You can be so happy that you'll die. You, know? you can't even contain the happiness, you just die. <laughs> and then you go back to the spiritual world. So the happiness in, in chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is a great ocean of transcendental joy. So we might say we sometimes, the first principle of human sanity is peacefulness. From, from peacefulness comes happiness, from happiness comes joy, from joy comes 
ecstasy, from ecstasy comes bliss, and from bliss comes transcendental madness. <laughs> These are different stages of happiness that takes one higher and higher, and so there's no limit. And that, that can be experienced even while we are still in this material world. <laughs> so that's the next benediction. And then, um, anandam buddhi vardhan pati pardam purnam rita swardhanam. That means that at every step that one is executing devotional service, the chanting of the holy name is bringing one closer to closer to their eternal relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. Every living entity has an eternal relationship with Krishna in one of the rasas. And that remains hidden, but it is also awakened through the process of chanting of the holy names. So, Pratipurdam means every step, there is newer and newer relay understanding of my relationship with Krishna. So that's the sixth benediction. And the last one is uh, Ananda uh, Pratipurdam Purnam Rita Swaradam Sarvatma Snapadam Sarvatma Snapadam that means, snapadam means a bath, and sarva means a complete bath. So what that means is that everything in relationship to your life becomes purified. Your home, whatever possessions you have, even those that are connected with you also get the benefit of your purification as you make progress through chanting of the holy names. So all of one's existence becomes purified. So these nine, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. These seven benedictions in the first verse describe the main benedictions by which one gets from chanting of the holy name. Now it's interesting how Lord Chaitanya is quite amazing. <laughs> I mean, he's God, so obviously he is amazing. But in composing this first verse, you'll see something really quite Chaito Darpana Marjanam Baba Maha Dervagni Nirvapa Nam Shreya Kaiva Vichendri Karvitara Nam Vidyavadhu Jiva Nam Anandam Bhuri Vardhanam Patipurdam Purnam Rita Svardhanam Sarvatma Snaparam Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtana. So he ends each of the benedictions with the suffix nam. Amazing, huh? Nobody could do that. <laughs> Only God. <laughs> and at the same time is completely perfect. So this is Lord Chaitanya and reciting the first verse. Now this first verse correlates with the first three stages of bhakti. That is Adhaustrata, Sarusanga, Bhajana Kriya. Now the four, second verse, Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nija Sarva Shakti Tatar Pita Niyamita Smarane Nakalaha Etar the Sri Tava Kripa Bhagavan Mama Pidur Daivam Riddisham Ihajani Na Nuragaha. In this verse, Lord Chaitanya said, and there's no rules. There's no regulations. There's no restrictions. Anyone can chant anytime, anywhere. And all of Krishna's energies are manifested within his names. And then it goes on to explain, and he has millions of names like Krishna, Govinda. So he glorifies the whole process of chanting and the names of Krishna. But then he ends the verse in saying, Durdaivam. Dordaiva means I'm unfortunate. Although everything is there, I have no attraction for chanting. So he's playing the part of a conditioned soul, explaining what is our situation. That although everything is there, where is the attraction? And why isn't there no attraction for chanting? Why? Dordaiva means because I commit offenses. <laughs> because I commit offenses. So in the second verse, he explains that everything is there, but this is my situation. Now in that particular verse, there's some important parts. Krishna has two categories of names. He has primary names and secondary names. 
One should chant only the primary names like Krishna, Govinda, Gopi Janavalava, Shamasundar, Gopal. The primary names of Krishna in his pastimes. The secondary names is Ishwara, uh, Brahman, uh, Parmeshwara. In other words, the, the names that connect with his creative aspect what he uses in order to create the material. Well, these are called secondary names. The primary names are the names of the Leelas. So Lord Chaitanya and of course the Acharyas explain that we should only chant the primary names of the Lord, especially he mentions Krishna and Govinda. And Nija Sarva Shaktis, in those primary names, all of the Godhead, all of the names, forms, qualities, pastimes, everything is found in the primary names of the Lord. In other words, as you chant, you realize Krishna through his name, through his form, through his qualities, and through his pastimes. And realizing Krishna through pastimes is the highest expression of, of transcendental knowledge. In other words, on that level, you have reached perfection. When you can chant the holy names of the Lord and Krishna's the pastimes, appear in your mind simultaneously while you're chanting. So that's a high stage of bhakti. So then, he says, Dordaiva, I'm unfortunate, but, but how do I get over my misfortune? Srinadapi sunichena tayor iva suhishnuna amaninam amanadena tirtani saradahi. He explains that these four principles, humility, tolerance, pridelessness and respect for all of the living entities are the ornament that the devotee, the practitioner, must adopt in order to make progress in devotional service. So the qualities of a Vaishnava, particularly these four, are exalted. And Lord Chaitanya says, and he ends, he says, Kirtaniya Sada, Sada means always. If one practices these and develops these qualities, then they can chant the holy name constantly. Mm -hmm. Then they, there's no problem with chanting. And chanting becomes natural, spontaneous. So therefore, Lord Chaitanya, out of all of the verses, put a lot of emphasis on the third verse and saying that this verse is the ornament of a Vaishnava. And if he practices this, then all of the good qualities of a Vaishnava manifest within the heart and within the activities of a Vaishnava. So this is the most important verse. To explain this verse, because each one of the four categories is, requires some explanations, and we actually give complete explanations on each one, but I don't think we have time to do that particular verse. But he compares humility, not like the grass, but like the straw. There's a difference. Sometimes we say humble like the grass, but if you step on the grass, it comes back up. But a straw lays flat, doesn't come back up again. So Lord Chaitanya, that's the type of humility that one should seek in order to practice the qualities and attract the attention of the Lord. Because humility is so powerful that it is bhakti itself. <laughs> It's explained that that quality of humility is a feature of bhakti itself. So one who is developed humility is actually serving the Lord simply by that quality. It is so exalted. And of course, that leads to tolerance and tolerance. Uh, in the Shastras, there's two types of tolerance mentioned. In the 14th verse, in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. What is that verse? Not... What's the first word? Matra sparsas tu konteya sit nusna sukadukada aga paino nityas tam stetiksava bharvata. So, as long as you live in the material world, you gotta tolerate. There's too much heat, sometimes too much cold, you have to tolerate the difficulties of other living entities, mosquitoes, government agents, 
trying to take all your money. <laughs> yeah, so much difficulties coming from other living entities. Higher powers, wars, pestilence, all these things. We've been experiencing these things lately. So one has to learn to tolerate these things. When that comes simply by having a material body and being in the material world, these things are there. And if you can't tolerate, it's difficult to live. <laughs> and there's another type of tolerance, which is... Hmm, what is that verse? I always forget the verse word. Uh, Canto 10. Huh? Tate nukampa shikshamikshamanam buja deva kritam vipakam vidva vubir vidadana maste jiveti yo mukti padesha dayabak. Krishna puts his devotees into sometimes some difficult situations. Why? Just to purify the devotee or to glorify the devotee. Sometimes a great soul will undergo great difficulties just to, to glorify that devotee and show that that devotee will never leave despite all of the difficulties. And that shows the world this is a great personality and that's Krishna's arrangement. So it goes on to explain in this particular verse that tolerance means that one accepts what Krishna gives not simply from the principle of tolerance, but the pr principle of happiness. They actually become happy that Krishna has put them in difficult situation, and they pray. They say, my dear Lord, actually, what you're doing, I deserve much worse. But because you are so kind, you're only giving me a small little token of what I actually deserve. Therefore, I offer my obeisances to you life after life. And in that verse at the end it says um, that the kingdom of God is the rightful heir to this person. Prabhupada uses the analogy just like parents may be wealthy and therefore if you stay in the family and you become good children then you, you bequeath, they, they bequeath their wealth to you upon their departure from the world. So you don't have to do nothing. All you have to do is be a good son or daughter. And you get the inheritance. So it says that one who follows this particular program for Krishna's purification and thanks Krishna, they're guaranteed to go back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> Very powerful. So that's humility, tolerance, and pridelessness. One doesn't want respect for oneself, and one wants to give respect to others. It's, it's easier or more natural to give respect to others, but it's hard not to want respect for yourself, right? Because like, you think, well, I'm giving respect to others, and why ain't I get any game? I need to get some back, you know? Keep me going. I need some, you know, some enthusiasm. So, but no, Lord Chaitanya says no that not wanting any respect for oneself and, and then he says give respect to others and of course the conclusion is kirtaniya sadarahi and one is spontaneously attracted to chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that's the third and that verse is um, nishta the fifth stage the previous verse was an art and a the fourth stage. The fifth stage is nishta. One practices that verse and cultivates those qualities. One is fixed in devotional service. <laughs> They're not going to move. From that stage, the next stage comes, which is the next verse. What is the next verse? Nam, nadanam, najanam, nasundarim, kavitam va jagadishakam uye, manma janmani janmani ishvare. Bhakti ahoy tuki I don't want wealth. I don't want followers. I don't want the pleasures of the opposite sex. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur adds another one. I don't even want to be known as a great proponent of Vedic knowledge. I don't want to be known as a scholar of the Vedas. 
I don't want anything. What do I want? Janmani, Janmani, Yishwari, Bhavadha, Bhakti, Arhoiti. In other words, I simply want to serve you, and if you want to bring me back another life, that, that is your will. You can do that. And I'll serve you life after life after life. There's a category of Vaishnavas. They're Vaishnavas, but they reinterpret that verse a little different. They say, Nadanam, Najanam, Nasundarim, but no Janmani, Janmani, Janmani. <laughs> Just this one life, I'll do it, that's all. <laughs> I'm not going to do it life after life after life. So, but, but Lord Chaitanya's uh, indication in that verse, no, is that the devotee is completely satisfied in devotee. And that platform is Ruchi. Ruchi means a sweet taste. And Bhakti Vinoda Akur explains there's two types of ruchi that comes with the execution of devotional service. The ruchi that is not dependent on circumstance or excellence of elements. He calls it excellence of elements. In other words, when the kirtan is melodious and the singer can sing nicely, then I get ecstasy. But if he's if he sings like Chandramali Swami, then, you know, there's no ecstasy. <laughs> so, in other words, the elements have to be precisely or nicely delivered, and then my happiness awakens higher and higher. But then there's one that there is ruchi without excellence of elements. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wasn't a good kirtan leader. <laughs> but he would sing. And sometimes his devotees go. But he would sing with bhakti. And they, were they, would, they would feel the bhakti and the fact that he didn't have all of the, what we say, excellence of elements, the, the melodious tunes and the expert, uh, you know, ornamentations that come with kirtan or with any activity of devotional service. So there's two levels. Those who can find happiness with excellence of elements and those who can find happiness without excellence of elements. The second category is more supreme. But both are the category of Ruchi. The next category, and that is the, uh, that is the uh, next stage of bhakti, and that is the sixth stage, I believe. Yeah. Seventh stage is Ayinanda uh, Tunuja Kinkaram, Patitam Mam Vishame Bhavam Buddha, Kripaya Tavapada Pankaja Stita Duli Sadrisham Bijinti. O Sana Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant. This is coming from the heart, not from the mind. Somehow or other, I'm falling into this ocean of material suffering. Please, please pick me up and make me an atom at your lotus feet. So the devotee is, real, is feeling real separation from the Lord. And in that separation, they're praying to the Lord. Please give me shelter at your lotus feet. Give me, give me the, the opportunity to serve you in pure devotional service. So this is the mood of Ashakti. This is the seventh stage of Bhakti. It's a preliminary stage of love of God. It, it awakens emotional expressions for feeling the separation of Krishna. That's the that verse. And that is this, the seventh stage. The eighth stage is Ayi Nanda. No, no, that's the no. Nam Nam. What is that? Huh? Nayanam gladadas rudaraya vaddanam gadgada rudaya gira pulakaya dichitam papukada tavanamakriha me pujish. So one is, one is, why am I not shedding tears when I chant your holy name? Why the hairs of my body stand up? I'm feeling some ecstasy when I chant your holy name. But one is feeling so uh, unqualified. So in this, this is an expression of bhava. This is the bhava platform. Now that's a very, very detailed expression of love of God because in those categories, one writes 
poetry to Krishna, one sings songs to Krishna, one draws pictures of Krishna, depending. One th thinks of different ways to express their love for Krishna in so many, so many varieties of ways. And they cannot stop thinking of Krishna. So this is bhava stage. Now, on the bhava stage, you can fall down. You can fall down. We have the example of Maharaj Bhart from the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. He was on that stage. He left everything. He left his kingdom. He left his family. He left everything. He went to the forest to finish out his bhaja. But while he was in the forest, due to his soft-hearted nature, he became attracted to a little deer that had no protection. The mere deer's mother died at the time that the baby was born. And so he took care of the deer, but he took care of the deer in such a way that he gave all his time, affection, and attention to the deer, and he's completely neglected his worship, his sadhana. And therefore, he fell down at the time of death, he thought of the deer, and in the next birth, he became a deer for one life, and then the birth after that. In his deer birth, he was aware of how he fell down in his previous life. So not wanting to fall down again as a deer, in a deer body, he would go but and associate with the sages and hear from them in his body as a deer, remembering how he fell down. Krishna gave him that special mercy that he could recall his mistake in his previous life. And in the next life he came Jad Bharat, and in that life he went back home, back to Godhead after finishing that life. Yes, so even on that stage of bhava, one can fall down. And there's other examples also. Now, that's that. Then now the next verse is Yugaitam nimeshena chakshusha pravishaitam shunyaitam jagat sarvam govinda virahename. I don't know if I'm qualified to speak on these verses because this verse is the preliminary, this is love of God in separation from God. This is the mood of Vipalamba Bhav, feeling intense separation. At every moment seems like 12 years or more. Just like, give you an example how time works. You all are probably aware of this because we experience it all the time. That if you're happy, Time goes fast. <laughs> well, the kirtan's over already. Wow. So we just started. <laughs> when you're happy, time goes fast. When you're unhappy, time goes slow. And when you wait, time doesn't move. You look at the clock, and then you look at it again, and the hand hasn't moved. <laughs> So that's the experience of waiting. So there, we're waiting, waiting for Krishna to somehow bestow his mercy on me by coming into my love, life in such a way that I can experience him. But in that waiting, I'm longing for that, that association for Krishna. And so it seems like every moment is like 12 years and every moment is transcendentally miserable. <laughs> I don't know if you could figure that one out, but transcendentally miserable. There's a happiness there, but at the same time, it's like a chutney. You can use that example. A chutney that's really hot, but so sweet you can't stop eating it. <laughs> it's a, you know, a chili baba chutney, you know, and it's got a lot of sugar. <laughs> And you can't, you just can't stop eating it, but at the same time you're burning. And you think, what am I going to do? I can't stop. So this love of God that enters into the heart on this stage is so deep and so feelings of ecstasy at the same time feelings of unhappiness. It's hard to, I can't explain it, it's not explainable. It can only be experienced. But the acharyas give some explanation in order for us to get a little indication of what it's about. And that is the nature of this. And this is 
The seventh verse is love of God in separation. And in that stage, one looks around, sees their friends not interested. They see their family, they see their money, they see everything in relationship to their life seems like a dreary void. It has no meaning at all. Uh, I think it was Jiva Goswami, no, Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das Goswami, in exhibiting that particular stage, he sees, he says, I'm looking at Govardhan Hill, it looks like just a gaping mountain, and so on. He's seeing everything, but he has no, it all looks completely uninteresting. So on that stage, there's nothing, you, you don't get interested. Everything that was important in your life has no importance anymore. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> it's a high stage of love of God. It's a preliminary, it's actually love of God in separation. All I can think of is, when will I meet Krishna? And the last stage, Aslishyava padaratam pinastumam adarshanam marmahatam karo tuva yata tata va viradatu lampato mat pranam nastu neva na paraha. This is love of God with meeting Krishna. So these two last verses really apply to Srimati Radharani. Because Lord Chaitanya is in the mood of Radharani, so he's exhibiting her bhava in the expression of these eight verses. And he ends with these two particular verses, which are love in separation and love in meeting. Vipralab and Sambhog. These are the two categories. And in that stage, that although Krishna is there, still, I, I'm feeling happy when he's there, but I'm also feeling miserable because he's going to leave. <laughs> the gopis can't feel happy because they know I'm with Krishna, but he's going to leave, and therefore my happiness will turn into something else. So they can't really enjoy happiness when he's there because they know he's going to leave. <laughs> you can figure that one out. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is one of the characteristics of this particular stage. And marma, the word marma, those of you who are fighters, and we have many martial artists here, they know the word marma means a blow to the body hitting the opponent. So in that expression, you can kick me, you can beat me, you can do anything you want with me. Still, I'm, I'm your eternal servant, loving servant. You my love unconditionally. So that last verse is the highest expression of devotional love. And no matter what Krishna, he's, he's called Lumpato. Lumpato means he's a Dabanshi. <laughs> he, you know, he, he's, that's him. <laughs> he says, I'll meet, he says to Radharani, I'll meet you tonight, and he doesn't come. <laughs> but still, she doesn't, her love for her, him, doesn't change. So this is this last verse. We can't really describe it, but if you read, the Acharya's definitions, they go into explanations of these two, two last verses in detail. What is love of God in separation? What is love of God in meeting? So these are the uh, nine stages of bhakti, characterized by the eight verses of Shikshastakam. And that whole prayer is there. So it's recommended highly recommended, not just recommended, that devotees, in particular, before you begin your japa, every day, you recite these eight verses. You can recite them in, in the Sanskrit, or if you want, you can also recite it in the translations, either one. But at least it should be done every day before we chant our japa, because they actually get, actually, I'll give you another explanation. This is from the Acharya. The first verse of the Shikshastaka prayer is Hare Krishna. The second verse is Hare Krishna. The third verse is Krishna Krishna. The fourth verse is Hare Hare. The four, four, fifth verse is Hare Rama. The fifth verse is Hare Rama. The sixth verse is Rama Rama. 
no, that's the seventh verse. The, the sixth, yeah, and the eighth verse is Hari Hari. So the eight couplets, 16 words, correlate with the eight prayers of Shikshastaka. Nice. That's coming from Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta. It's, it's not somebody's idea. <laughs> and so we can see that the chanting of the Shikshastaka prayers is actually chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It's that powerful, these prayers. And there's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's loving expression in pure devotional service for himself in the mood of his own devotee, Srimati Radharani. So, these prayers are very special. One should study them, learn them. There are devotees who have given seminars on these prayers. Um, and there's devotee, and also, um, there's one senior devotee in our movement. I think his name is Ravinda Sarup. He's actually written a book, or is in process of writing a book, on these eight prayers. So, study these prayers, learn more about them, and it'll help you greatly in your chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Kila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Is there anyone who would like to add a, say a question or just, yes. We have a hand way in the back there. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful uh, lecture. Very, it's very difficult to summarize the entire Shikshastakam in such a short span. It was very beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, these, the thoughts that I express by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Shikshastakam are very exalted. I mean, even the first verse itself is mm. very exalted and going up to the final verse, it's it's way beyond our understanding and our realization. So, uh, as sadhakas who are struggling with just plain chanting, you know, with just with our chanting we are struggling. So, what should be our aspiration and what should be our prayer when we chant these prayers? How should we understand how to apply them? Because most of them are beyond our realization and our understanding. So, how do we practically try to imbibe in our life. Lord Chaitanya emphasized the third verse. <laughs> and that emphasis comes by encouraging those who understand the third verse to practice that verse. And as we practice that third verse, Trinadapi Sunichena Tayori Vasahishnuna Amanina Mamanadena Kirtaniya Sadarihi we get newer and newer realizations in the process of bhakti. Krishna Dav Kaviraj Goswami, he writes that uh, one should take this verse and string it on the necklace of the holy name and wear it as your ornament. He says, this is the ornament of a devotee. And that gives you entrance into the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And it's in proportion to the level we develop each of these qualities. Whatever humility is there, it will always give some entrance, but when one develops these qualities in full, of course that's a lifetime cultivation, um, then the holy name, you don't even have to chant the holy name, the holy name will come to you. <laughs> in other words, it's called, there is, there's a term called swaroshisha. Swaroshisha means spontaneously attracting, spontaneously attract, chanting the holy names of the Lord. In other words, it just, it just flows within the heart and mind of the devotee. And that's a high platform, but it's, a, it's available through the process of bhakti. So if we cultivate these 
qualities in the third verse, then we can understand how bhakti works and how we should fit in, how we actually fit into the science of bhakti. It's, that's the most important of all these verses as far as the execution of devotional service. And when you get to the, by following that, when you get to the later stages, then these, these stages carry, auto, carry automatically. These are on, what is he on, Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga Bhakti starts right at the beginning of Ashakti. When Ashakti develops, then Vaidhi Bhakti turns into Raganuga Bhakti. And of course, there's Raganuga Bhakti Sadhana, and we should also follow that, and that's explained in the Shastras. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Vaidhi Bhakti is just the stage leading to Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga Bhakti is Bhakti. Natural, spontaneous attraction in the mood of the residents of Vrindavan. That is our actual goal in devotional service. And that develops on that st on a stage of ashakti. It's, that's the preliminary stage of development. And if we recite these verses every day, read about them, hear about them, try to understand them deeper, they also help to give more and more awareness of our how to execute devotional service. Devotional service is big. <laughs> it's bigger than Krishna. There's only one thing bigger than Krishna, devotional service. <laughs> yeah, it says there is bhakti, bhakta, and bhagavan. Bhakta is the devotee, and bhagavan is Krishna. And when the bhakta has bhakti, he can control bhagavan. And so bhagavan is controlled by Ananya bhakti, not just bhakti, ananya bhakti, that bhakti which is unalloyed, pure bhakti. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, that nitya siddha krishna prema, sadho kabunoy, sravanadi siddhi chitte, kodi e udari, in the hearts of all living entities, not only in human form, but any light living entity, there is pure love for Krishna there. But only in the human form of life can it be awakened. So that love is pure. We have pure love for Krishna. It's, it's not something you have to, you know, go to the store and buy or bargain for or try to find. All you have to do is uncover it. It's there. It's in your heart. It's, it's you. Everyone is naturally in love with Krishna. It's natural. Just like breathing is natural for the body, and we don't even think about breathing, it just goes on. So our love for Krishna is that is, is as natural as our breathing in this, on this level. It's, it's just natural. And these prayers will help us to understand more how we can execute our devotional service to awaken that love. <laughs> and these prayers, I can't, and I can't, I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the class that the, the Goswamis wrote all their books based on these eight, eight verses. So how deep these eight verses are. And it's really hard to even explain. They're just deep and each, each verse, each word has unlimited meanings. Mm -hmm. As bhakti. <clears throat> Anyone else would like to offer comment? Yes. Okay. We need the microphone. We got two microphones. Okay, that's good. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for such a wonderful class. Uh, so beautifully explained each verse of Shikshastakam. Uh, so continuing Prabhuji's question a little ahead. Uh, as you said, the four, uh, the Trinadupi Sunichana verse, the third verse of Shikshashtakam, are the ornaments of a devotee. So the first and the foremost is Trinadupi Sunichana, which is developing a uh, little, little louder? A little slower. Okay, little slower. Okay. 
so first and you know very foremost is trunadu pisu niche na uh-huh. which is developing humility and even chaitanya mahaprabhu says to sanatan goswami that it is nothing else but humility alone that conquers the heart of the lord right but for a new fight duty what tips you would like to give to start a journey to develop genuine humility well humility is explained in the bhagavad gita prabhupad gives one explanation humility means not wanting the situation to be honored by others everyone wants to be honored by someone even you get married so you can get honored by your wife or husband right <laughs> everyone looks for honor or some kind of prestige some some kind of uh importance so but the actual essential definition of humility is not wanting the facility to be honored by others that's the main definition humility means that god is great and i am small and but i can do great things only by the mercy of god not in and of myself i don't have that qualification but krishna can fill my heart he can fill my mind with his mercy and i can do great things so you even even people who are truly humble do wonderful things why because they're simply opened up their life to the mercy of the lord and they depend on the lord in everything they do so that's one of the features of mercy i mean humility is to completely depend on the lord in each and every circumstance mm-hmm. and now you have to practice i mean it's not easy to so always depend on the lord but the main the main principle is to remember the lord that's the main principle of depending on the lord is when you remember the lord you open up that mercy because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. krishna is not different from his memory if you remember him he's with you to that to, to the degree of the intensity of that memory or that thought mm-hmm, like that yeah. so that's humility and someone else gave a definition that humility means think of think of you don't think of yourself less but think less of yourself or is it the other way <laughs> people think oh well, i'm so rotten i'm hard as horrible uh, i must be humble <laughs> but that's not humility in other words don't think about yourself so much think about krishna think less think less about yourself and not less of yourself okay in other words people are always thinking about themselves that's contrary to humility but don't and but don't think of yourself less think less think less about yourself not think of yourself less does that make sense okay that's that's an iskon defin- definition but it's pretty good <laughs> and then there's other statements of humility in the bhagavad gita in that 13th chapter verses 8 through 12 the first two ana ana amanit amanitam anambitvam anan amanitvam is humility so that verse is the 20 items of knowledge so those who are actually humble that's a feature of knowledge mm-hmm. humility doesn't mean uh, what we say a uh, low self esteem that's not humility that's another form of false ego i couldn't make it so i must be you know useless i mean therefore i go to the psychiatrist and he tells me how good i am and i pay him some money and i feel better <laughs> that, that's not humility humility is more a quality of the soul's relationship with krishna the g the word jiva means tiny so what is what is our actual size in measurement the upanishads describe that the soul is 1/10000th the size of a tip of a hair so if you take a hair and you cut it into a 
hundred parts, and you take that one of those hundred parts and cut it into another hundred parts, that's the size of the soul. That's from the Upanishads. And so that means it's you can't see it. It's obviously you know, not seeable. But the soul is so small. But in the material world, we think, I'm great. <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> and the material world teaches you, you got to be great in order to be happy. You got to have a lot of money. You got to have good position. You got to have good looks. You got to do things that are seen as being qualities of greatness. And then you're happy, right? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> because you see, and this is statistics, that people who have these are not very happy. They're very miserable, actually. Because it doesn't go to the soul. It doesn't go to the heart. It stimulates the mind, and therefore it, it doesn't do anything for the living entity. It gives some false sense of happiness. That's all it is. And it's all temporary anyway. It's gone in due course of time. Mm. But our relationship with Krishna is eternal. And as we build it, it never goes down. <laughs> so it is explained that if you become 70% Krishna conscious in this life, and then you fail to make it 100%, then in your next life you pick up from 70%, and then you continue on. It says if you're born in India, you're born in this land, that means generally you had either great pious activities in your last life, you're a fallen demigod, or somehow or other you have performed devotional service in previous lives. That's mentioned in the fifth canto. So be born in India, Barbumi, means to have a high birth. So that means your Krishna consciousness is a good start. There's something there from the past that's already, it's like you, somebody put some money in your bank account and you didn't even know it. <laughs> so that's how it is. So taking birth in India, but India is moving towards the West now, right? It's looking towards, you know, TV and what else, fast cars, girls with less clothes on. So it is, it's shy chasing after what is called it's just garbage, that's all it is. Broken pieces of glass, that's all it is. Material happiness is not happiness, it's hippiness. <laughs> it's not. Hare Krishna, Jai Ho. Hare Krishna. Welcome. Yeah, so these things don't satisfy the heart. But Love satisfies the heart, and that love is love for Krishna. So that's what this verse means. Thank you so much. Wonderful experience. Thank you. There was another question right here. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for this wonderful class, first of all. Uh, my question is, uh, for the start, when we are starting uh, Krishna Consciousness practice, the sadhaka is on the platform of uh, uh, Anartha Nivritti. But uh, when we see the devotees, uh, some, so many devotees like uh, some specific in the Krishna Consciousness practice, like devotees like Kirtan, some devotees like uh, hearings and like that. The, uh, this is a platform of uh, Ruchi. Then how we distinguish between that uh, Anartha Nivrittis and uh, Ruchis and this, at the same time? Or, uh, you can't tell what a devotee was in their last life or what they're doing in this life. Some devotees come, and it's the beginning of their Krishna consciousness. Some have performed devotional service for many lives. So when the wood is wet, it takes some time to dry out. And then when it dries out, it ignites. But if the wood is already dry, it ignites immediately. So not everyone who comes to devotional service is on the same level. 
that's due to your pious and devotional activities in previous lives. If you haven't, haven't had any, if you're simply here by the mercy of the Guru, then uh, you're more inclined to, the, to follow the process very carefully and make step by steps. But there's others who go through the process a lot faster because they've, already, they've done it already in previous lives. And so, as explained, if you take dry wood, it, it, it ignites fast, but if you take wet wood, you have to dry it out before. So some of us are wet and some of us are dry. <laughs> and some of us are in between. <laughs> so you can't categorize or evaluate or even judge another person. You simply have to understand that the process is, wor is working, not just the one life, but life after life. Yeah. But the mercy of the Lord is powerful, just like Jagai and Madai. They were so sinful, but simply by getting the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Lord Nityananda, they were many, they already reached a very high platform of devotional service. And there's many other examples. So Krishna's mercy is available for everyone, so one can make faster progress, even though one is not so advanced, simply by learning how to get, get, get that mercy. So how do you get that mercy? Shushusha sharanana sya vasudeva kata ruchi sanmayat seva viprati punya tirtana seva not serving great souls. If you serve great souls, that's great service. And by that service, you make fast progress in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. You develop a, a taste, a ruchi for hearing and chanting. Now there's where, this, this is, some people say, well, what is the secret? Associate and service to great souls is the fast track in devotional service. But you also have to be careful in that association not to commit offenses. But this is the way to go. It's like you walk into a, a sweet shop and there's so many varieties of sweet. So you just want to eat a few. But if you eat the whole shop, you know, you're going to be sick the next day. <laughs> Or even half the shop. So, you know, it's a sweet shop and you think, oh, wow, here I am, I finally made it. And so now you're trying to enjoy, some, but if you go too far, and the result is, you know, so, so a good thing, not misused, turns into something else. So the best thing is to get sadhu sangha, and especially those who are fixed in devotional service. And hear from them and look for opportunities to chat, to serve them. And if you do that, you'll make fast progress. But if you commit some fences and that's, or you, your mind is not in the right consciousness, and you're not, you, won't, you won't make any advancement and you may also go down. So therefore, it's like a cutting edge. But still, we seek out that association. Therefore, with humility, you can't make any mistakes. If you're humble, you're always in the best position to make fast progress in devotional service. Humble means gratefulness. Gratefulness means to be thankful for the mercy that Krishna has given you in the association, having the association of devotees, having the association of advanced devotees. Does that help? Hare Krishna, thank you. Is there anyone else? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sri 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 Shikshastakam Ki, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Gaur Premanande, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Hare Krishna.